Hi everyone, welcome to week six of Computer Science 225. This week we're talking about two topics which are both really important and need to be covered, but neither of which really warranted a whole week just uh, dedicated to it. And so today we'll talk about two more or less unrelated topics, the first of which is the man page system in Unix. Now, all of the commands we've talked about so far, like ls and mv and cp, we've sort of talked about the basic usage of it, and then we've talked about some of the most uh, popular, widely used options that these commands have. So for example, with ls, we talked about the dash a option to list all of the files, the dash l option to list all of the details for the file, like when it was last modified and the size of it and stuff like that. But all of these commands actually have lots more options and lots more capabilities that we haven't covered yet. And so the place where you find these options and uh, discover the full workings and details of all of these commands are called the manual pages or man pages for short. All of the commands we've talked about and really all of the rest of the Unix commands we'll cover in this class, they all have a manual page or a man page dedicated to them. And so the first thing we'll do in this week is talk about these man pages, how you access them, how you read them, and how you find all of the different options that these commands have. This is really important because oftentimes you'll need a command to do something specific or you'll want to sort of customize the way that it's working in some way, and the man page lists all of the different options that you have. Most of the commands have uh, a lot more going on than, than we've really covered in this class. For example, the ls command actually has 59 different options that you can give it, most of which you'll probably never use, and so the goal of using Unix is never to like memorize all of the different ways that the commands can be used, but rather uh, learn the most basic sort of patterns and then be able to go to the man pages when you need something more. And so that's why we'll talk about man pages. The second topic that we're going to talk about is file permissions. So every file in the Unix system has a permission set for it, which determines who is allowed to read the file, who's allowed to write the file, make changes to it, and who is allowed to execute the file. If the file is a program, you can have some people allowed to execute it and some people not allowed to execute it. And so we'll talk today about first, how do you find the permissions that a given file has so that you can see who has access to it and who doesn't. And we'll also talk about how to change the permissions to give access or take access away from different people. All right, so let's pull up a terminal and we can talk about our first topic, which is manual pages. So like I said, commands like ls have many more options than what we have used so far. And so the place to see all of these options is the manual page for the ls command. This can be done with the command man, short for manual, aka like the, the instruction manual for all the commands. And so we can give man the option of whatever uh, command we want to see the manual page for. So if we want to see, for example, the manual page for ls, we could type man ls. And when you hit enter here, it's sort of like Vim in that it brings you up this interactive program. It doesn't just print the contents onto the screen. It is this sort of uh, interactive program that we can use and sort of navigate through. So as you can see, the ls command man page has a couple of different sections. It has a name, a synopsis, and then a description. The name sort of just gives you the name of the command and a brief description of it. This synopsis section sort of lists the different ways that the, that the uh, command can be used. Here we have ls, followed by some number of options, followed by some number of files. The brackets here means that this part is optional, uh, and that uh, goes for both the option section and also the file section. So you can give ls a optional option and an optional file. And because they have this dot, dot, dot part, that means you can give as many as you want. So this sort of gives you the syntax for using the command. You can say ls and then as many options as you want, including zero, and then as many files as you want, including zero. Let's look at another uh, man page for uh, a different command before we go and talk about the description so that we can see more possible options here for the synopsis. The ls, uh, or rather the man 
window here we can quit out of by doing Q. As you can see, it has at this little bottom part this text sort of explaining what to do. It says or Q to quit. So I can hit Q, and then I'm back at the terminal window here. So as another example command, let's open up the man page for MV, which has a little bit more interesting part in its synopsis. So here's the manual page for the MV command. Its synopsis section has three different ways that we can run this command. This first one here is sort of the one for which we're going to be moving a file into a new file name, so renaming a file, basically. Here we have the source, which is required. As you can see, it's not in brackets. That means we absolutely have to have it. We have the source followed by the directory. So here we can just move one single thing to a new name. We can still give it as many options as we want because it's uh, in brackets. That means it's uh, an optional thing. We can have it or leave it off. And it has the dot, 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 so we can have as many as we want. We can also give it the dash T option, which we can look down below and see what that is for. The source here and the destination, there can only be one of them because there's no dot, dot, dot. And they're required because they're not in brackets. That's sort of how you read this thing. Then the second option is when we want to move a bunch of things into another directory. That's another sort of usage of this MV command. So here we can still give it as many options as we want. And we have to give it one source at least because it's not in brackets. But there's a dot, dot, dot here, which means that we can have as many sources as we want. So we can say like MV file 1, file 2, file 3 into a backup directory. For instance, you can have as many sources as you want, but you can only have one directory that is the target for where they're going. There's another usage for MV where you put the directory where they're going first and then the source is second. And you do that by including this dash T command. If we scroll down in this, we can see that the dash T command specifies the target directory. And so if for whatever reason you want to have the target directory first, and then all of the source directories after that, you can do it that way. From time to time, I actually use this method of doing MV if I want to like move a bunch of files and I know where they're going. I'll say MV into this target directory, and then I'll sort of think about and list all of the things that I want to move there. So the, uh, oh, the main point of this, though, is that the synopsis sort of gives you the different syntaxes that you can use for calling the command. Some, like ls, just really have one way of doing it. You have your options and then your files. Others, like MV, it's a little bit more complicated, and there's different ways of doing it. Let's go back to the ls man page, though. And now we can talk about these flags that ls takes. So here, again, our synopsis is simple. We give it some number of options or flags, and then we give it some number of files that we want ls to do the listing on. Now in this uh, program, this man program, as we've seen, you can type q to quit out. You can also use j and k to go up and down, just like in vim. You can use space to go down sort of like at a page at a time. And I think you can use page up or page down as well. You can also use little g to go to the top or capital G to go to the end, sort of like Vim, except in Vim, as you maybe remember, it's little g, little g, two little g's to go to the top. In ls, it's only one. So that's how you can sort of page through this thing. Then if we do that, if we sort of page down, or rather go down with the j key, we can see that there are different options for the ls command, all of which are detailed here in detail. For instance, here we have our friend the dash a uh, option, which we talked about when we talked about ls. And as you can see, the description of it is do not ignore entries starting with dot, aka list all the files, even the ones that are hidden. As you can see, there's actually two things on this line, dash a, which we talked about, and also dash dash all. And this is true for a lot of the flags that we have here. For example, we can do dash b or dash dash ignore backups. Most commands, for a lot of their options, they'll take a short form of it and also a long form. The short form is always a single character with a single hyphen. And the long form is two hyphens, and it gives you like an entire word, sometimes multiple words like this. Uh, of course, without spaces, you never um, do spaces in these. It would be a, hy a hyphen if you have multiple words. And so this is two different ways that we can give the same exact option to the ls command. If I quit out of here, I can type ls minus a to list all of the files, including the ones starting with dots. Or I can do ls oops, ls dash dash all. These are identical. It's the same thing to do dash a as dash dash all. 
the reason that there's sort of both of these uh, possible ways of writing it, either dash a or dash dash all, is just to sort of be more convenient. So for the commands that, or rather for the options that I use a lot, like dash a, I'll um, be more likely to use the short form of it because I know what it does. I've used it a lot of times. Whereas for other ones where I don't know uh, it as well and I'm not as used to using it, you can give it the dash dash option. And the reason for doing that is because it's sort of more descriptive. If you tell somebody to use the dash a option, it's maybe not as clear what it's doing. Whereas if you tell somebody to use the dash dash all option, then it uh, sort of is more self-descriptive, if that makes sense. Something else I'll talk about is that these options can actually be tab completed just like files. So as we've seen, the tab completion in Linux is really powerful. If I type lsp, for instance, and then hit tab, it'll show me all the things that start with p. And if then I choose the next letter, for instance, like PR for project, I guess that's the same as program. OK, well, if I do PROJ and then hit tab, there's only one possible thing to match that. And so tab completion will complete file and directory names. But tab completion also will complete or try to complete the uh, options that you give to commands as well. So if you start something with ls dash dash and then hit tab a couple of times, it'll actually suggest you all of the different options that you can give to ls here. And so then I can uh, sort of see what my options are. That's another way of sort of seeing uh, what these options are. And the long names, like I was saying, are sort of more easy to understand what it's doing rather than just having a single letter to go off of. Something like ls uh, dash reverse is probably easier to understand. And so now you can see it printed them in reverse alphabetical order. So that's another way of sort of seeing the different options that a command has is with tab completion after you do the dash to start an option. But as we go down, so I've sort of explained why there's two here. There's dash capital A and dash dash almost all. One other thing to mention is that the options are case sensitive. So dash little a is different than dash capital A. So the difference between dash little a and dash capital A, they both print all of the files, meaning the hidden files as well. But dash a also prints just the dot and just the dot dot itself. When we talked about ls, we explained that the dot is an alias for the current directory, and dot dot is an alias for the directory one above us. So if I do ls dash a, it lists these as part of the directory tree here. It says there's a dot and a dot dot. But every directory has those things. There's not really much reason to list them. And so dash capital A actually does basically the same thing as dash A, except it doesn't list the two dots. It only lists the sort of normal, regular files, including those that start with a dot like this. So that's something we learned by reading this man page. As you can see, these are case sensitive because they do different things based on whether it's an uppercase or a lowercase letter. And they have different long forms. So dash dash all and dash dash almost all will correspond to whichever one you want. Notice that some of them only have long forms. So this dash dash author does not have a short form associated with it. I think that the reason for this is because there's only so many letters, right? And uh, not all of the commands necessarily can have a short form. We're limited to 52 if we stick with sort of regular letters. And also, the word author starts with an A, and so we might want A or capital A to be the short form of this, but those are already taken for these other commands. So if we want to use author, we have to give it the long form of this. And notice that sometimes they're not actually like um, related. <laughs> here, here, dash dash escape is dash B, um, even though it doesn't really start with the same letter. So as you scroll down, you can see all of the possible options. Many of them we won't ever really use. Some of them, if you notice, have this little equal sign after them, like for instance, dash dash color has this equals when as a possible thing we can give it. Dash dash format has this equals word that we can give it, and so on. Some of them have these equal sign things that they're set equal to. These options need us to give it some other information sort of to go along with it. 
So what we do for those is when we give that command, we have to fill in what it's equal to. That's a good one I can do. I think down here there's width. Yeah, so this one, dash dash width equals calls. This sets the output width to a certain number of columns. So by default, ls sort of fills in the files and directories that it's listing in sort of a sensible way so that you can sort of see them lined up by columns. ls, if you want to for some reason, will let you determine how wide those columns are. So if I just do ls, it sort of lists them all in uh, sort of this order like this. As you can see, though, if, if we do ls minus a, so I have more stuff here, it lists them in columns. And it automatically figures out the column width in a way that makes sense and looks good. But if we want to, we can set the width by doing this dash dash width equals. And so some of these options, like dash dash width, take sort of a argument as well. So dash a, we don't give it any argument, we would just say, do, do the dash a thing, you know, list all my files. But dash dash width, we need to tell it what width we want the columns to be. And so then we can put a number in here, like, I don't know, maybe uh, 25. And then that will list them in columns of 25. It looks like that was uh, not sufficiently large to get more than one column. I think if I put like 35, then it'll put it in sort of two columns. It determines how many characters the column can take up. So you can sort of just play around with this and get it to print out in a way that you like. Uh, this probably isn't terribly useful most of the time, but if you were writing a program that wanted to like dump it out to like uh, you know an HTML file or something like that, and you wanted a certain number of columns, then you could use that to play around with it. Now for the ls command, if you look at this uh, for our dash width, Another thing that you can do inside of this man program is search. So if we want it to search for dash width, we can do it just like in Vim. You type the slash to start searching, and then you type what you want to search for, and then you can hit enter, and it'll bring you down there. So this dash dash width equals columns command, this also has a short form, which is dash w. So if we want it to do it with dash w, it would look like this, dash w 50. So with the short form, when it takes an argument like this, you just do the dash in the short form, like dash w, and then a space, and then the argument to it, in this case, 50. But when you have a long form, you do it like this, dash dash with equals 50. I'm not really sure why the syntax for it works that way, but that's when you have a short form and a long form of an option like this, the way that you specify the argument, if there is one, is a little bit different. Let's open up man ls again and look for some more stuff we can talk about. Here's another one, this dash dash color option. This doesn't have, as you can see, a short form. It does take an argument, but this argument is in brackets. And remember, in the man pages, the brackets always means that this thing is optional. So we don't need to give it an option, uh, but we can. As you can see, when can be always, auto, or never. So if I do this one, I can do ls dash dash color, and that prints it with color. That's actually the default. But we can also say dash dash color equals, what was it, always was an option. And as you can see, that gives us uh, color output. Or you can give it never, which will print it without color. If you don't like the colors for some reason, you can control that. And you can also give it auto as a command. And that will, based off of the context, determine if it should print with color or not. This is actually the default. Auto is the default. And the reason for that is because if you do other things with the ls command, like send its output to another program, which we'll talk about in a few weeks, then it will turn the color off. So uh, that's, that's another thing that these commands can have. They can have optional parameters to the options as well. So here, dash dash color, you can use it just by itself, or you can give it an equals always equals auto or equals never. So you can scroll down through this. Like I said, the commands for these are um, J and K can move you up and down. Space goes sort of a page at a time. You can use the slash to search. So if you want to search for a specific thing like recursive, then you can use that. The N, just like in Vim, sort of goes between the different options, either capital N to go forward, or uh, uppercase, or rather little n, lowercase n to go forward, or capital N to go backwards. G brings you to the beginning. 
little g brings you to the beginning, I should say. Capital G brings you to the end. Q quits out. There's also this H, as you can see down here, for help. If you ever forget these commands, you can type H, and then it will give you all of the commands that this man program takes. There's a lot more that we didn't talk about, but uh, those are the basic ones. They're also listed on the note page for this, uh, this week down, down below. All right, so I think that is really everything to do with the man system. Every command has these manual entries for it, so we can look at the man page for CP, or the man page for MKDIR, or even the man page for Vim, which you can see here and read about, or the man page for Git, which we covered last week, to see all of the different sort of options and subcommands that Git has. You can look at the man pages for it. You can even look at the man pages for man itself, which looks kind of weird. The command would be man man. And so here you can read through and see all of the different things uh, about the man uh, system. Interestingly, there's actually different sections for the manual pages. We've been looking at section one. So if we type man ls, it actually lists this one up here that says this is from section one of the manual. There's, as you can see, different sections as well. Some of them have to do with programming stuff. So when you're doing C programming, you can look up the system calls and sort of the C library calls. Linux and Unix in general are sort of deeply tied with the C programming language, and so they share a lot of the same things. And for one, the manual system is sort of the same between them. So if you're doing C programming, there's this function called scanf, which is like a scanner in Java. It's used for reading input. And if you want to read the documentation for the scanf function, you can just type man scanf. And as you can see, that brings you to section three of the, of the manual, which has to do with C programming uh, functions like this. And so here, you can also read about stuff like that. Sometimes there's something that exists in multiple pages of the manual. For instance, the printf function is used for printing in C, like system.out.print in Java. And if you type man printf, it will actually bring you to section one, because printf is also a Unix command. We can use printf instead of, um, actually, we haven't talked about how to print things to the screen uh, in Linux, but um, there's this printf command, so you can printf like, hello, and then it'll print it out for you. Uh, and so it's a command, so it's in section one of the manual, but it's also a C function, and so you can look it up in section three of the manual as well. So if you need to tell man what uh, part of the manual to go to, you can give that number before giving the thing you want to look up. So now we'll look at man three printf, which should bring up the printf function, which is from section three of the manual on C programming. But in general, as just sort of a new user of Unix, what you can use the man system for is for looking up the commands that you need. And for instance, if we want to look at the rmdir command, we can type man rmdir. This is the thing you really need to know. And you'll be able to read the synopsis to figure out how to use the command, and then the description to figure out all of the different options that it takes. RMDIR, as you can see, is a much simpler command than LS or CP or MV, because it doesn't really have that many different options. But you can read about the ones that do exist in the man pages. All right, now we'll turn our attention to file permissions. We actually have seen file permissions before when we did the LS with the dash L flag. When we do this, we see all of this stuff over here on the left as the first column. These actually indicate the permissions that these files and directories have. The way that it is listed is not the most user-friendly at first, but it actually kind of makes a lot of sense once you get used to it. So that's what we'll be talking about next. First of all, this first thing, the first letter here, is actually not part of the permissions itself. This just tells you what sort of thing this is. So when it says D here, it means directory, which you can see because LS highlights directories blue by default. If it's a dash, it's just a regular file. If we had a symbolic link in here, we talked about symbolic links in, I think, week two or three, uh, we could see something different. So if I make a link to program.py called maybe like prog.py, and then do ls minus l, we'll see that the symbolic links actually start with an l. So this first little symbol isn't really part of the permissions. It just tells you what sort of file this thing is. 
the rest of them, though, the RW, Xs, and dashes, those give you the permissions for the file. And they're broken up into nine characters. The first three characters tell you the permissions for the user, the person. But the rest of the letters past that, besides the first one, the D or the L or the dash, those give you the permissions for the file or directory. And they're broken up into three sections of three each. So there's an RWX here. That lists the permissions for the owner of the file, which is called the user section. So the RWX, in this case, will be for me, because I'm the owner of this file. That says that I'm allowed to read and write and execute this file. That's the owner section. The second set of three, this case having r-x, is for the group of the file. This is for the um, group, which is, in this case, faculty. This says what other faculty, essentially, are allowed to do. They're allowed to read the file, because the dash, or rather the r is there. And they're allowed to execute the file, because the x is there. But they're not allowed to write the file, because the w is missing. And this last section of three is for other people who aren't me, the owner, and who aren't in the group of the file, which in this case is faculty, just other users of the system. In this case, it would be the students, I guess. They're allowed to read this directory, and they're allowed to execute this directory, but they can't write it. So what does it mean to execute a directory? That means that you can CD into it. So if you're allowed to execute a directory, then you can CD into it, and you can potentially read and write the things that are in, those, in that directory. If you have a directory for which you don't even have X access, then you can't CD into it. So that's what execute means for something like this. It means that you are allowed to go into there. That's what it means for a directory, I should say. If we look at this file down here, this one has the dash for the first thing. That's just because it's a regular file. It's not a link or a directory. Then it has rw dash for the first section. That's the owner section. That's my section, because I'm the owner of the file. That says that I'm allowed to read the file, and I'm allowed to write the file, but I can't execute the file. That's because it's uh, not marked as an executable program. Then the group, faculty, they're allowed to read it, but not write it or execute it. And others are allowed to read it, but not execute it or write it. Uh, the usage of group is probably not that widespread. Uh, the most important of these two generally is the owner of the file, what you can do with it. And then these two sort of together are usually the same. The, usually we don't uh, delineate between what the group can do and what other people can do. That is a thing you can do in Unix, though. You can set up a directory and then give that directory a special owner, uh, or rather, give that directory a special group, put people into the group, and then you've given those people and only those people access to that file. So for instance, if you're working on a group programming project, you can make something called like project one, and then change the owner of that project to like a group containing just your team members, and then give them read, write, and execute access on the directory, but not give other people read, write, execute access on the directory. So the group system can be used for doing things like that. But generally speaking, probably the group section and the everybody else section is usually just the same. This is just people, not me. What can they do with this thing? So let's look at another example. Let's do an ls minus l on slash. This is the root directory for the whole system. As you can see, we have all of these files are owned by root, and the group is root as well. And so some of these things we're allowed to read and execute. Of course, root is allowed to do whatever it wants to these things. It can read, write, and execute them. Uh, the read, write, execute for links doesn't really isn't really valid. Links don't have read, write, execute permissions. It's just whatever thing they're linking to. So for these ones where they're symbolic links, those are actually sort of like not meaningful. But for this one, uh, let's see this root. The slash root directory is the root user's home directory. As you can see, root is allowed to read, write, and execute that. But we're not allowed to do any of those things. As regular users, we can't read, write, nor execute the slash root directory. So if I try to do ls slash root, it will tell me permission denied. 
if I try to just cd into slash root, because I don't have permission to execute it, it will also tell me permission denied. And of course, I can't write into it. So if I want it to like uh, create a file in slash root called like stuff.txt, that won't work as well. Here I've failed at reading the directory with ls, executing the directory with cd, and also writing into the directory with the touch command. So because I don't have permissions on this, I am not allowed to do it. The other directories, most of them, like for instance, slash user, I do have read and execute access. So I can list, uh, rather, slash user, and it will let me list what's in there. And I can cd into slash user and list it. I have permission to read and execute this directory, but I don't have permission to write this directory. So again, I can't make a file inside of here. It will not let me do that. Permission denied. If you get permission denied when you're dealing with the CPSC server, probably you're in the wrong directory. So if you're like not allowed to create files or not allowed to edit stuff, you probably just need to go to your home directory and do it there. Of course, you're not, as regular users, allowed to change with the workings of the system because that would probably quickly bring the system down as somebody accidentally made a mistake and sort of changed a file that they weren't supposed to. All right, so let me go back to my home directory with the cd command. Now, how do I change these permissions? That is done with the chmod command. And there's two different ways we can use chmod. There's sort of the way that's probably easier to understand, where we can just change the permissions. And then there's a sort of more trickier way that we'll talk about later. But the basic way, we will do chmod, and then we'll list either u, g, or o. u stands for user. That would be like my section, the first three characters. Group is the G, and other is the O. So there's always user, group, other. And then we either plus or minus one of RWX. So if I want to make it so that the group and the other can't read my bin directory, that would be done like this. chmod, and then as many of UGO as I want, in this case just G and O. Then a minus or a plus to indicate if you're giving or taking away permissions. And then RWX. Uh, as many of those as you want to indicate what permissions you're adding or taking away. So chmod go minus r is take away the read permission from group and other. So now this shouldn't be here, this r, and this shouldn't be here either. If I do, oops, uh, I have um, out of habit the ll command. I have that alias to be ls-l. We'll actually talk about how to do that next week, how to make aliases like this. But if I do ls minus l, just out of habit, I did it this way. If I do ls minus l, now you'll see that this one has changed. The chmod command has changed the permissions for this bin directory. So now the group can't read it, and the group can't execute it either. If I wanted to undo that, I could do chmod go plus r on the bin directory. That would add, oops, sorry, uh, that would add the read permission back in for the bin directory for both group and other. If I wanted to make it so that people in the group, the faculty group, could write into the bin directory, I could do that with chmod group plus w onto bin. And now you will see that this w appears. This is how we change these permissions. We give either u, g, or o, or a combination thereof, either a plus or minus to indicate that we are taking away or adding permissions, and then r, w, x, uh, one of those or a subset of those to indicate which of the permissions we're adding. So let's say I wanted to give myself permission to execute the program.py uh, script. The reason for doing that is because then I can execute the program directly. So right now I can run this program by doing python3 program.py, and that'll run this little Python script. But if I want to, I could set it up so that I can run it directly by typing it like this, program.py. Uh, by default, it won't let me run this program. It says permission denied because I myself don't have 
permission to execute this file. But as you're writing scripts and programs and things like that, you can set it up so that you can directly execute a program by just giving the name of it like this, rather giving the path to the file. So if I want to do that, I can say chmod user plus x, and then give the name of the file, program.py, and then I should be able to directly execute it which would be, again, done like this, dot slash program.py. And now I do have permission to execute this program, and so it will execute as a Python program sort of automatically. So now if I do an ls minus l, we'll see that this x here does appear. I am allowed to execute this program. If I want to let other people execute it, not that they would necessarily want to, I can say group and other plus x as well on program.py. And now I have program.py giving execute access to the group section and the other section. So again, it's broken into these three sets of three. The first one is me, myself, as the owner of the file. The second is my group. And then the third is the uh, set of everybody else who's not in the group and isn't me, myself. Each of these has the three symbols one for reading the file or directory, one for writing the file and directory, and one for executing the file and directory. If I want it to make sure that, for whatever reason, I don't accidentally change this program, I could take away from myself write access to it. I can say uh, chmod u minus w on program.py, and that will make it so I am not allowed to write this file anymore. Now I have this r-x here, which indicates I don't have write permission. I could run the program still, program.py, like that. I can read the program, so I can cat it to the screen, for instance. But if I open it up with Vim and try to make a change to it, Vim actually will tell me this is read only because it knows about permissions. If I change to make, or rather, if I try to make a change to it and then save it, Vim won't let me. It will prevent me from doing this. I don't think. Uh, yeah, okay, Vim is uh, kind of a smart program. Uh, if, you, if you really tell Vim to do it, oops, um, it will go ahead and change the permissions for you. So Vim, uh, as we can tell, actually did let me write it, but that's because it knows that I am the owner of the file uh, and am allowed to change the permissions. And so if you really force it to, it will make the change. Uh, and now if I open up program.py, well, you see it does have these extra lines at the bottom. So Vim uh, sort of lets you work around this, I guess. But if I tried to make other changes to this, like let's say I try to add a line onto the end of the file, which uh, isn't a thing we've talked about how to do yet. But if I just try to add on to the end, we'll talk about this syntax in a couple of weeks. It will tell me permission denied as well. It doesn't let me change the file uh, because I don't have write permission. Of course, if I want to give myself permission back, I could do chmod user plus w on program.py. And then I would now, again, be allowed to write this file because I gave myself write access back to it. So like I said, you can give these as many or as few as I want. I could take away all permissions by doing uh, user group other minus rwx on program.py. That will take away all permissions altogether. Nobody's allowed to do anything with this file. You can't look at it. You can't write it. You can't execute it. You can't do nothing. Uh, but then, of course, if I try to do things with this file, it will give me permission denied. But because I'm still the owner, I'm still allowed to change the permissions back. So I can give them back. I can say user plus rwx. Let's say I want to do all of them. I can also separate these by commas. I can say go plus uh, just read and let's say execute on program.py. Now it restores them back the way they were with the user being able to read, write, and execute, and everybody else, group and other, being able to just read and execute. So you can use chmod this way to sort of modify the permissions based on what's there. Now there's another way that we can use chmod, which is a little bit complicated. And so we'll move over to the whiteboard so I can sort of explain how this works. So the other way that we can use chmod is with these octal modes. And this gets very geeky because we're going to talk about binary numbers. 
So there's only so many possible permissions that a file could have. And I think that with the three permissions, read, write, and execute, there's only eight possible things. We could be able to do nothing to the file. We can just be able to execute it, just be able to write it, be able to write it and execute it but not read it, just be able to read it, just be able to read it and execute it, be able to read it and write it but not execute it, or be able to do all three things. And so each of these symbols, the RWX, is either there or it's not there. And because we have three possible things, this gives us two to the three or eight possible ways of doing this. And so these can be represented with binary numbers 000, 001, 010, 011, 100, 101, 110, or 111. So you see this, if the letter appears, it's a one, and if the letter doesn't appear, it's a zero. And so each of these has a decimal, or rather in uh, a base eight value, which is zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. And so the other way that we can use chmod is by giving these numbers indicating which of the permissions should be set. So if we give something six, that means we can read it and write it but not execute it. If we give it one, that means we can just execute it. If we give it four, then it's read only. If we give it seven, we can do everything with it. And so the way that we can do the chmod command like this is we can give it three numbers from this sort of table indicating what we can do with the file or directory that we give it. So if I'm doing it on program.py, I give one number for the user, one number for the group, and one number for other. So if I want to be able to do everything to the file, read, write, and execute it, I would give it a seven here. If I want the group to be able to, let's say, read it and execute it, I can give five. And let's say I want everybody else to just be able to read it, then I can give it a four here. And so you choose from this sort of table the permissions that uh, should go for each of the three things, user, group, and other. So let's try that out. If I move back over here to the terminal, we can play with this and give different permissions to the program.py. So let me clear the screen. Uh, right now, the permissions are like this on this file. Uh, rwx, r-x, r-x. If I do chmod 754, I think it was, on program.py, then it sets them like this. In this case, the only difference is that it got rid of the x here. But the thing about the chmod command is that unlike the, or rather d doing it this way with the numbers, the, the way that it's different from the past way is that now we're not really like modifying the permissions. We're not saying add or subtract this permission. We're saying set this permission to exactly this. So if I set a file to 000, zero, zero then you can't do anything with it. It's all zeros. If I want to, again, make it so that I can do everything to the file, but nobody else can, then I set it to 700. And so now, if I do my ls minus l on program.py, we'll see that I am able to do everything. I have all three permissions, rwx, but the other people have nothing. They have zeros, which means no permission at all. So the other way is probably easier to understand the way where you say like g plus ro to say the group can now read uh, the file, stuff like that. But the uh, way of doing it with numbers you will see online sometimes, and it is a uh, important thing to understand and to know that you can do this, even if you prefer doing it the other way when you actually need to change permissions. I. Um, Usually do it this numerical way, though, because uh, I sort of in my head associate different numbers with different permissions. So sort of the default permission for a directory, uh, for me, for a directory is 755. So 755 on my like public HTML directory is what this was already. This is 7 because I can do everything. And 5 means read and execute but not write. And so 755. Uh, in my short, in the way that I understand it, is that means that I can do everything to the directory and other people can read and access it, but they can't write it. And so 
uh, I'll, if I need to set the directory, the permissions on a directory will usually just use the number because I find it quicker. Likewise, the sort of normal file number is 644. That means I can read it and write it, but not execute it. And other people can just read it. So if I set program.py to 644, then that makes it so that I can read it and write it. That's the 6, because that's a 1, a 1, and a 0 for read, write, and execute. And other people can just read it. So that's 1, 0, 0 or read but not write and not execute. So you can use either one of these two systems. The difference between them, again, is that the one where we say like chmod uh, user plus write and stuff like that is sort of like modifying the, the permissions that already exist. So add or subtract a permission from what's there. Whereas the one where you set the permissions directly like this is sort of uh, erasing anything that's there and resetting a new permission for all three of the things. So that is setting the permissions on files and directories. This is a thing that you'll have to do from time to time. For example, if you're setting up a website on the CPSC server, you'll need to make sure that your files and directories are readable by other users because when somebody goes to your website in a web browser, it needs to be able to pull those files. And so they need to be readable by other people. Likewise, if you're creating a program that you want other people to be able to run, you might need to set the execute permission. So this is a thing that we'll have to do. So in this week, we talked about two topics, which, like I said, uh, both warned uh, serious discussion, but which didn't really warrant a whole week dedicated to just them. And so we kind of grouped them together. First, we talked about man pages, which is a super important thing to be able to use and know about, so that if you need to see more detailed information on any of the commands we're talking about, you know where to find it and how to sort of access and interpret that information. Then we talked about file permissions, both how you understand the permissions that exist on files, which govern what you can and can't do in the system, and also, crucially, how you can change those permissions on the files that you own. Of course, you can't change the file permissions on other people's files. Uh, only the owner of the file is allowed to do that. So that's all for this week. We'll see you next time. Thanks.